All right, well, let's get rolling here. Well, last presentation, we examined the allure of the moral ideal of socialism, including its Marxist expression. And many 19th to 20th century artists have been drawn to the moral ideal of equality and personal dignity that social theories expressed. But in the end, we admitted that these ideals haven't worked historically as far as long-term viability is concerned. The utopian ideal ultimately has ended up in dystopian totalitarianism. Socialism pays you based on what you need. Capitalism pays you based on what you earn. What has traditionally caused a loss of faith in socialism among the workers is witnessing equal pay for non-equal effort and the inefficiency of bureaucratic socialist governments, which end up resorting to coercive measures to control society rather than persuasive measures that inspired the movement in the first place. But are coercive measures, which increasingly erode personal freedoms, viable? Well, we can just ask the members of the former Soviet Union for an answer to that. Nearly every country in the world organizes its economic system along capitalist lines. Nearly every country does. And yet it also summer, suffers from a bad reputation. The Judeo-Christian tradition can be blamed for capitalism getting a bad reputation, I believe, but particularly Christianity can be blamed. In all four Gospels, there is this dramatic scene of Jesus throwing out merchants and lenders from the temple. And I think many have inferred from this scene that making money is somehow not compatible with a spiritual life. Then there are these statements by Jesus. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Or this well-known statement, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. A little later, St. Augustine stated that, quote, business is in itself an evil. <laughs> and St. Jerome claimed that a man who is a merchant can sell them if ever please God. Well, today, capitalism is seen by its detractors as catalyzing greed, causing environmental degradation, fostering unfulfilling consumerism, and causing the exploitation of masses of human beings and animal species even. Capitalism, since its inception, has had an image problem, you could say. We saw in the last presentation that socialism really has its basis in Christian teaching, and several references in the book of Acts claim that the earliest Christians formed socialist communities. But the capitalists can reference scripture in their favor as well. Many of you are familiar with the parable of the talents, in which a business owner gives five talents to one servant, two talents to another servant, and one talent to another servant. And he asks them to use the money to create more money. But the one with the five talents and the two talents, while they double their money and please their boss, the one with the one talent, well, he just buries it so that he doesn't risk losing it in some kind of bad investment. And he is condemned in the parable for not trying to at least invest the one talent to earn a little less interest. In other words, he wasn't a good capitalist. And then out of later Christian tradition during the reformation of the 16th century came a voice extolling the virtues of the business life. The Protestant reformer John Calvin helped change the way societies think about making money and his teachings on the virtues of business helped streamline the growth of capitalism beginning in the Dutch Republic. In his writings, John Calvin promoted the Christian virtues of thrift, hard work, honesty, and duty. All these virtues are critical for business life. And he also argued that running a business honors God more than fighting wars or flagellating yourself in some far off monastery. But he still taught merchants and bankers to beware of greed, degeneracy, and idleness, which were constant temptations with the accumulation of wealth. 
Calvin believed in the ascetic ideal, which is self-denial and self-control in service to a higher purpose. And he applied the ascetic ideal to business life. Calvin emphasized that the ascetic ideal could be realized in business by reinvesting profit back into the business rather than blowing profits on luxuries or hedonistic lifestyles. Such ideas not only promoted sound business habits, but also brought a religious legitimacy to the accumulation of wealth, as long as it was used in a proper way. And his arguments had their effect on society. All across Europe, lazy aristocrats were now looked down upon. While thrifty, hardworking merchants were admired. But with the Industrial Revolution and the publication of the Communist Manifesto, and later the rise of the so-called robber barons, well, that brought another shift in public opinion. In the first part of the 20th century, anti-capitalist art was prevalent. World War I was blamed on the greed inherent in the capitalist system. The poster on the left reads from the bottom where the laborers are. It says, we work for all and we feed all. And then right above that, you have the perspective of the bosses and the capitalists who say, we eat for you. And above that, or we will shoot you. That has to do with labor strikes in which people were shot. We fool you using even religion to placate the masses so that we can exploit you more. We rule you as an undue influence over the leaders of society. That was the opinion of critics of capitalism. America's most prominent evangelist for socialism, Richard D. Wolff, is an economist at the University of Massachusetts. And he argues that we may have political democracy to a degree, but we do not have democracy in the workplace. We have to ask for permission to take time off to spend with our families. If our boss says we must work late, well, we've got to work late or we risk losing our jobs. And our bosses even determine how creative we can be at work. Our creativity is sometimes a very good thing in the workplace, but if you're an accountant, I don't think creativity is necessarily a good thing. Creative accountants often end up in prison. And then, of course, there is this highly democratic feature, undemocratic feature, I should say. Our bosses receive an undue amount of the fruit of our labor in the form of profits. Philosopher Alain de Baton, you've heard me quote him often, claims the reason capitalism is so unpopular is because of its empty promises. For one thing, it claims that anyone can succeed. De Botton says, in reality, the likelihood of reaching the pinnacle of capitalist society today is only marginally better than were the chances of being accepted into the French nobility four centuries ago, though at least an aristocratic age was franker and therefore kinder about the odds. It did not relentlessly play up the possibilities open to all and so in turn did not cruelly equate an ordinary life with a failed one. But de Botton claims capitalism is insidious because it makes other promises that aren't true. Capitalism through its commercials and marketing tries to convince us to buy products and services that won't deliver on their promises and certainly won't satisfy our highest needs. For example, Dove soap has had a lot of interesting taglines over the years like this one. Improving your mind, body, and soap. Well, their soap might be an improvement over my soap, but I've tried Dove before and I still have the same body and the same mind with all of its flaws. I still have blotches that I would like removed. I have unsightly scars. Those didn't disappear after using Dove. And I didn't grow taller, I didn't grow stronger, and my mind was still a little bit foggy. <laughs> so you get the picture. Alain de Baton is not anti-capitalist himself. 
He believes that capitalism could serve a higher purpose if great fortunes could be made providing wisdom, meaning, human connection. Currently, most fortunes are made at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you see right here, not by providing our needs at the top of the pyramid. Well, I don't know about that. I think I have to disagree. I would say fortunes are being made, or at least a comfortable salary, allowing a freedom in lifestyle by providing for our highest needs. So let's look at this. Look at that yellow line in the middle there, belongingness and love, greater human connection. Well, Match.com and other dating applications seem to offer at least an approximation of this need, I believe. And then above it, what are the esteem needs, such as prestige? and a feeling of accomplishment. Well, merely running any business would seem to offer these, as well as the various jobs capitalists create where success in such positions leads to a strong sense of accomplishment. It is after all in a capitalist's best interest for their employees to succeed. And they often give them the training and tools to succeed. And then look at the top of the pyramid, self-actualization. It's easy to see there are many people scattered across the social media landscape making, let's say, a nice, comfortable living, offering ancient wisdom, spiritual direction, and helping people reach their full potential. Now, such little tiny business operations won't equal the net worth of an Amazon or a Microsoft and the like, but they usually aren't in it for the money. At least these businesses aren't. They're in it for freedom and autonomy that running a business can often provide. The artist is often placed in this higher category because creative self-expression is considered one of our highest needs. But artists tend to suffer creatively in Marxist societies because they are initially encouraged to lend their talents and service to the state, but eventually that encouragement becomes a requirement if the artist wants to earn a living to serve the needs of the state through their art. As I mentioned in the last presentation, artists do well when they challenge the prevailing paradigms of a culture and of a society, whether they're in a socialist or a capitalist environment. That is why artists do tend to be progressive politically, but they also do their best when they can experience the ethos of freedom. Free market capitalism has historically offered that level of freedom. But another difficulty artists have with the spirit of capitalism is it's, it commodifies their artistic creations. Well, what's so wrong with that? Well, in his classic book on this very issue, Lewis Hyde in The Gift argues that artistic expression, like any calling that seems to come from God or heaven or some other transcendent realm, is experienced as a gift. And it doesn't feel right to the artist to put a price tag on their work and put it out there in the marketplace where someone who doesn't necessarily appreciate the spiritual aspects of it may purchase it merely as an investment or for decorative purposes. If I receive the gift of artistic inspiration, shouldn't I then gift it to others? If any of us receive a free gift of any kind, don't we naturally feel an inner compulsion to pay it forward? To give a gift of our own? Freely we have received. Freely give. Alongside a later edition, I showed you the original edition of this book because it shows more clearly a shaker painting of a basket of apples. Lewis Hyde explained his choice for this cover image in a note. The shakers believe that they received their arts as gifts from the spiritual world. Persons who strove to become receptive of songs, dances, paintings, and so forth, were said to be, quote, laboring for a gift. And the works that they created circulated as gifts within the community. Hyde argues that art is best suited to societies whose economic system is closer to a bartering system. Well, that may be so in spirit, but is such an economic system practical on a macro level, at the level of cities, states, and nations? I can believe it works on a 
micro level, say in small communities where neighbors will help each other with gifts of food and tools and transportation and other services. Hyatt is actually unable to offer a viable alternative to capitalism in his book. Even though it leaves him uncomfortable to have to subsist as an artist in one, capitalism, at least what we have, and its track record for fostering, fostering creativity is unmatched historically. You see, capitalism is really about problem solving and creating a business to solve problems. In other words, capitalism by its very nature promotes an ethos of creativity. Capitalist societies don't survive if they don't continually solve problems through innovation in the marketplace. Now, some may argue rightly so that capitalism is creative in an insidious way as well by inventing problems and then offering the solution. Big pharma is often accused of inventing disorders so they, they can provide the cure for us. Maybe restless leg syndrome is a real thing or maybe I just need to stretch more and hydrate myself properly. Capitalism might foster the creation of problems that don't really exist, but it certainly also fosters creative invention that solves legitimate prob problems and enhances the quality of our life. When we visit the great art museums of the world, are we aware that nearly all the great art produced in the last 300 years or so was created in capitalist societies? Why do Marxist experiments end up becoming dictatorships rather than utopian societies based on the Christian ideals of truth and freedom and love? Because of the human variable, it seems to me. For humans thrive when they have aspiration and inspiration. Marxist societies remove external incentives to arete, that Greek word meaning the striving for excellence. Capitalism recognizes the innate human tendency to desire prestige, power, and comfort. And these certainly have their dark side, but also have produced remarkable innovation, sparked remarkable creativity. And acquiring prestige usually requires us to become excellent in some way. And isn't excellence, realizing our potential, our arete, one of the highest moral virtues? And socialist or communist societies have struggled to figure out a meritocratic system of remuneration or reward for proper labor. For example, Marxist artist Frida Kahlo that we met last week, if her art is seen as more valuable by the art collecting world, should she be paid the same to paint as an artist who does not work diligently on their craft or simply doesn't produce any work that anybody wants. Socialism in its ideal form relies on persuasion. And that is what Frida Kahlo was doing through her art, expressing her experience of life in a way that would draw us into that experience. But what if the government said to her, you can only create art that supports the state? Would she have become the artist she did? Would she have remained creatively vital? In order to remain the dominant ideology, communism has historically abandoned the powerful persuasion of its moral idealism and resorted to strict control of the people through the erosion of personal freedom and democracy. Why? Because of human nature. Human beings produce more, work more, create more when incentivized. Remove the incentive and we naturally become less motivated and need more threatening authoritarian means to get us to work. The Soviet Union tolerated modern art for about a decade after its inception, but gradually artists such as Vasily Kandinsky and Kazimir Malevich had to either leave Soviet Russia or abandon their abstract style because the Stalinist government demanded that art must support communist values in the state. Kandinsky chose to leave while Malevich stayed. Kazimir Malevich is lesser known than Kandinsky, I believe, 
for the fact that he did stay in Russia. At the time, he was probably the leading avant-garde artist in Russia, at least from around 1915, when this painting Black Square was created, to the time Joseph Stalin began the suppression of art, artists and intellectuals in the 1930s. Much of Malevich's early work was infused with religious iconography. Joseph Stalin, however, established state orders for artists that came to be known as Soviet realism. Here are its core tenets. All art must be relevant and understandable to workers. Composed of everyday genre scenes, realistic, and supportive of the official state and party goals. Well, this painting right here, Black Cross, didn't exactly fit the guidelines laid out by Stalin. Whereas Vasily Kandinsky left in 1920, Malevich stayed in Soviet Russia and gradually changed his style to fit the requirements. Take a look at the pose of the woman on the right. She holds her arms and hands like a Madonna, but there is no infant savior she is presenting to the world. Absent now from his art is the religious iconography that was an important part of his early work. Malevich died of cancer two years after this work, Woman Worker, was painted. He was only 56 and should have had a greater legacy in the West. But unlike Vasily Kandinsky, he stayed in Soviet Russia. Such is the fate of the exceptional artist in a Marxist society. I'll leave your last impression of Malevich with these earlier works. For all of capitalism's ugly warts, does it not allow us the greatest opportunity to express ourselves authentically and to spur us to realize our highest potential? Now there's much more about capitalism, its moral and creative implications that I have left out this morning because of time constraints. I'll try to work them in next week when we look at uh, more hybrid forms between socialism and capitalism. But I wanna leave us now time to offer our questions and comments. I'd love to hear your opinion. I hope none of you will be afraid because of the provocative nature of the topic. You could also comment if you're present on anything I discussed last week about socialism. So right now, the floor is open.